Welcome to this episode of ITEP Academy Connect Series. Extensively serving on various industry advisory and expert committees, actively advocates for 3D printing initiatives as a mentor and nurturer of startups. Next, we have Dr. Jerry Fo, who is a professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at NUS, and he's also director of the NUS Center for Additive Manufacturing. He holds other academic appointments as well and has been active in AM research since 1995, establishing and working with advanced AM labs with the support of entities like NAMIC, EDB, NRF, ASTAR, and industry. On to the next speaker, uh, we also have Dr. David Allen, who is Associate Professor at Yong Lulin School of Medicine and also Associate VP for Health and Innovation and Translation at NUS. He is also a Senior Consultant at the Division of Infectious Diseases at National University Hospital. He was a faculty member at Cornell, where he was recruited to Singapore to establish the Infectious Disease Training Program. Associate Professor Allen was the first head of Department of Infectious Diseases at the Communicable Disease Center. He has been a fellow of the Academy of Medicine of Singapore and a member of the Singapore Medical Association for over 25 years. From the industry side, we have Miles Podmore, who is CEO and founder of eye to eye and he brings 25 years experience in the IT and healthcare industry. He and his team developed eye to eye to become a leading Southeast Asian supplier of accessories and solutions for the healthcare industry as part of its strategy to help hospitals go filmless and digital. AM solutions were added to their product range about seven years ago, encompassing vertical markets in manufacturing, engineering, design, architecture, and healthcare. He also has a separate enterprise focusing on providing services in 3D printing models for the health and dental care industry. And then we also have Boyle Suwono, who is Chief Technology Officer of Structo, where he heads the building and scaling of the technology development team. He is responsible for the design and development of technical aspects of Structo's high throughput, throughput 3D printing technology, initiating the first in the industry's bespoke high volume, fully automated solution. He also co-invented other end-to-end -end 3D printing solutions for consumer and industrial applications. So with that, let's get into our discussion. As mentioned earlier, the topic for today is, is how Singapore's 3D printing change makers navigated and stepped up the COVID-19 challenge. So Dr. Ho, perhaps you could give us some context to our discussion in terms of like how the initiative came about and NAMIC's role in pulling to different parties together. Thank you, Jane. So, uh, well, back in the January and February uh, this year, we, we actually knew that we were headed into a pandemic situation. Um, uh, we, you know, beyond Wuhan, we, we were uh, reading news from parts of the world, from Spain, Italy, uh, it was starting to report increasing high number of infections. So at that point in time, we knew we, we had to, uh, you know, galvanize uh, our community, uh, especially the 3D printing ecosystem. Uh, and we have a sizable number of companies that space in Singapore uh, that offers uh, uh, 3D printing solutions and, 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 and products. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to be part of the whole uh, global 3D printing network that was you know, always, obviously uh, already starting to look into how to bring some of these supplies that were in shortage uh, to, to uh, production. Um, and uh, we were, you know, everything was just happening at the same time. We were receiving inquiries from our local hospitals and, and thus, so we decided the best way, you know, to was to, to facilitate the process of connecting the solution seekers and solution providers by creating these uh, COVID-19 microsite on our website, to, just to facilitate that matchmaking process. Um, we actually didn't really start initially on swaps. We actually looked at uh, a lot of the similar things that the global community was looking at, like the personal protection equipment, such as mm. uh, face shields, masks, uh, you know, uh, potentially also non-invasive respirator uh, solutions as well as ventilator components. Essentially parts that could be designed and 3D printed quickly. So we're working with partners like CJM, Siemens, which were featured in your, one of your first, uh, you know, uh, series, um, as well as some other SME startups uh, like Open Basco, which, which came, came up with some pretty innovative design uh, in face masks. Um, at about the same time, we actually were then uh, in some ways activated. Uh, so we were, you know, we concluded as well from all the news that was coming, that there was a need to uh, look into uh, more, uh, uh, some of these uh, test kit solutions that uh, were starting to, to uh, you know, were starting to go into short supply. 
And we know that a lot of these test kits, like the swaps and the valves and the, you know, even the biotransport meter, these are all imported. And we knew huge quantities were needed, right, in the millions. Um, so actually, when we first looked at this, we, we were not thinking so much about 3D printing, but we were looking at it from a perspective of how do we bring the local supply chain uh, quickly up and, up and coming. And uh, eventually, we decided on the two-pronged approach, right? So uh, both uh, 3D printing and traditional manufacturing solutions uh, uh, were, were looked at together. And 3D printing was actually uh, activated as a phase one uh, sort of work stream to accelerate the development uh, because we know we know that this uh, uh, you know that this technology allows a very quick direct design, a digital design translated to manufacturing, uh, pretty much one step process, as opposed to the traditional um, injection molding process where you require uh, creating molds, which is quite expensive and takes time to create, as well as qualifying uh, tooling uh, for for even fabricating uh, small quantities. Um, and of course, the idea was that once you have a design, a validated, clinically validated design, is cost effective, it's manufacturable, we can then uh, bring on the injection molding uh, extreme. Um, there, there were three uh, criteria that we actually looked at. Um, you know, so once we decided we want to do that, we wanted to put together a, a basically a SWAT team. Uh, so we look at uh, the companies that we have in Singapore. We had to make a decision who we wanted to engage with. And the primary criteria for us is was to look for companies that has a strong track record and expertise in uh, biomedical, uh, preferably 3D printing uh, in the manufacturing uh, space. Uh, also, there was a need, uh, as you know, this is a medical devices, so you need uh, ISO certification. Uh, the, the specific ISO certification required is ISO 13485, so we needed basically manufacturers with maturity are certified, so we didn't have to uh, wait for them to go through that process. And last but not least, we knew that the technology that was very suitable for this was uh, SLE, or steroid lithography. Um, um, so, um, so that was the 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 um, you know sort of the reason why we we brought in uh, Structo and we brought in I2I I because of their deep expertise. Um, I2I I actually uh, you know worked with Foam Labs. So Foam Labs is a U.S.-based unicorn startup, uh, uh, and. They specialize in SLA technology, similar to Structo. Structo is actually a Singapore homegrown uh, local 3D printing manufacturer, also based on SLA technology. Um, now, beyond the, the manufacturer selection process, um, the, the one of the challenges that we faced initially was, of course, the, the commercial justification. Um, mm. So we had to, because all the business volumes were down uh, pretty much at 80, 90%. So you know, how do you actually convince the company to invest procure and you know to secure feedstock stock supplies and mm -hmm. also to buy machines and things like that so we had to bring up machine capacity in the, in the hundreds at least based on our initial estimation to, to basically manufacture millions of these swaps uh, so fortunately we were able to uh, rope in the support from Tomasic so Tomasic played a leading role in this and also mm -hmm. EDB EDB actually also uh, supported uh, basically the two companies that we have identified and they were very swift in, in um, you know assuring us through uh, actual PO placement and all that to ensure that the CapEx would, could proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, so time was really of essence, right? So everything happened very quickly. I would say it was literally within days and a week or so. Days, um, wow, other, gosh. Yeah, so, yeah, that's right. So another challenge we had was to, to get a buy-in as well, uh, HSA. Uh, HSA is a health science authority. Um, so traditionally, we never had a, we were not able to the, the guidelines of, on 3D printed medical devices was not very clear. And uh, fortunately, because of this pandemic, uh, HSA was extremely forthcoming. So they actually provided a lot of the initial guidelines to us so that we ensure that our companies and the 3D printed swaps can meet the necessary regulatory requirements. Um, and uh, of course, we, we have another company that we brought in as well, Tusud, uh, which is instrumental uh, in establishing the standard testing qualification. Was was there a, a particular ministry that actually directed everything, or was it strictly at the industry level, uh, a crack team, literally b between the different entities, uh, the government agencies, and so forth? W was there some d major directive coming from the top level, and then you had you all had to st start action, or was it something more yeah. of a ground up initiative? I would say it's a combination of a lot of things. I think there were in parallel a lot of, uh, I would say, separate initiatives that were started. Uh, for example, there was a national task force, a swap task force team that was started, uh, led by NUH, uh, 
by Prof. John Wong. So he's a very mm. senior guy, the okay. ex, uh, CEO of uh, NHS. So they, they actually also started uh, uh, basically looking at how to jumpstart the local supply for uh, mm. test kits. Uh, on our side, it was mainly because we, we, are, we are from the 3D printing community. So, so we knew that this was something uh, um, very urgent and very much needed. Uh, looking at other countries and also through our channels uh, mm. in the market, we knew that this was mm. uh, in, in shortage, or at least going to be in shortage pretty soon, because mm -hmm. most of the countries that were uh, affected, especially like Italy, uh, they are the primary manufacturer of uh, open swaps, which is the, the gold reference, what, the, what most mm. clinicians would use locally. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was shut down for uh, a long period of time. And a lot of countries were hoarding supplies on valves and things like that. So, so, uh, so yeah, so I think it, it was a, probably, I would say, uh, a combination of many factors. Many different groups came together. They had, all had the same idea, which was mm -hmm. to make sure Singapore doesn't get into, into a situation where you have short, shortage of these tests. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe could you share a little bit about the business perspectives of it, like, or well, maybe not business, but more the production end of it, because uh, you may well come up with the plans, the projections of volumes needed, uh, how to execute things like that. But if there's a backlog in terms of production cap capacity and things like that, that will really be like, you know, put pay to all your the best plans. Yeah, we, we, we knew that the, uh, the technology that uh, as far as 3D printing, and I think uh, our partners, uh, manufacturing partners like uh, Structo and Icoic and after that, we knew that the technology has, has great agility. Uh, mm. we, we, you know, like I said, we, uh, even though these two companies obviously had, a, had expertise in this space, they don't really have machines just sitting around waiting to do these uh, uh, swap manufacturing. So, so they literally had to activate their uh, suppliers. Uh, so in night to ISK, they had to activate Bone Labs US. Unfortunately, we were able to secure, uh, you know, ring fence. I almost literally have to ring fence the, the, the machines as well as the feed stock. Mm. Instructo is a machine maker. They, in fact, uh, boy can share to that. I think they actually buy bought back machines from their customers in order to, uh, you know, uh, jumpstart the whole manufacturing. So it was a very, uh, I, I would say, I was very impressed with the, the speed uh, at how uh, our, our manufacturing company were able to, mm. to, to get this going. Um, on the design side, I think, uh, and I think we will talk a little bit about that too, but uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 this was something that we, of course, at the time, theoretically, we knew that was a, a, it's a very direct process. Um, I mean, there's a slide that I have uh, which can show up. Uh, mm -hmm. So just yeah. to, for, for a lot of the participants here may not understand the difference between 3D printing and, and injection molding. So, uh, mm -hmm. Traditional injection molding, you, you did need to go through a prototyping process, which usually you use an injection mold. Uh, but fabricating these molds are uh, very time consuming and also very expensive. So most mm -hmm. manufacturer, traditional manufacturers will not make these molds un until they know that there is millions of quantities, uh, you know, is required. Mm -hmm. On top of that, so it's a bit of a chicken and qualify. egg thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you also need to qualify the tooling. And then, uh, so that's also another process. So, all in all, uh, typical cycle time is about four to six months from design to point. Wow. So as opposed to you look at the, I mentioned the 3D printing is a direct design to manufacture. So uh, mm -hmm. in our case, uh, from, the, from the design phase all the way through uh, clinical trials, uh, I mean, completed clinical trials at NH, which uh, David Allen was, uh, was leading that activity. It took us uh, about six weeks actually. So, That's so uh, when, when after the design has been cleared and all the tests yes, were, were done. Yes, uh, okay, we right. went through like thirty designs or something like that in wow. three to four weeks, and, and then the wow. rest of the two three weeks was really clinical mm -hmm. trials and, and collecting data, analyzing that mm -hmm. to make sure that the, the swaps that were manufactured three D printed uh, technology is uh, usable, is safe for use, and, and it does serve its purpose. Mm -hmm. hmm. Maybe we can show some of the. What yeah, would it look like, you actually? Go to yeah. The next slide, if, I think. Yeah, again, the next slide will be for helpful. People and, who don't and, know what, yeah. what this looks like. Uh, not this one. The next. The, the next one. The, the next one. Yep, yeah. There we so go. Uh, so the, the traditional one is on the right. So it looks like a cotton bud uh, at, mm. at, at the end of a stick, which is a very soft stick, uh, and you can see the the, the 3D printed swaps uh, that you know on the left hand side. So 
So the team actually came up with two designs eventually out of the many, many iterations. And both designs actually worked, but eventually the, uh, the clinicians, uh, uh, experts, experts from NUH actually did, uh, picked the, uh, the one on the left hand side. Mm. Uh, from, from you know taking into consideration other factors like patients' comfort and, and uh, wow. cost-wise, okay. it's very competitive. I mean, of course, it's not. Uh, you know, we all know that for volume manufacturing, uh, traditional manufacturing will always uh, win hands down anytime. Uh, but at the at the peak of the crisis uh, during COVID-19, in the period between March to uh, even I would say June, um, the the the, uh, the original coping swab were were at least a uh, you know, selling at three to four, more than four times, actually four to five times what its original price was. So we were able to, you know, in some ways justify that uh, commercially this was viable. Mm -hmm. I have some questions about the design. I had to see up close like this, pretty impressive. And I'm just wondering like, you know, wow, what went into the, the design itself? So I believe uh, Prof. Jerry, was like the the, the 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 guy leading in in that the design aspect of this yeah so maybe um prof jerry you can tell us a little bit more about when into this this whole like you know the, the different design iterations what the considerations or whether it's like uh we would, someone was even talking about like the sort of sustainability perspective it, is this uh, reusable or at the end of it, when you dispose it, can you kind of like reuse the material in some way? Maybe you can share, 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 with, share with us a little bit about what went into this design itself. I believe you are muted, Jeff, uh, Jerry. Hey, uh, thank you, right, there we go. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of the design, basically usually we are looking at two type of design. One is the uh, engineering design to fulfill the functional requirement. And second is uh, industry design uh, that cover the economics aspect, the comforts of the usage. And thirdly, I think important thing for these special medical devices, uh, we need clinical validations. That's different with any other products. And these type of medical devices go into patient tests and accuracy is important and comfort to patient is important, but most important thing must serve the means of connecting the samples for, for PCR screening. That's how the design came together with, uh, you know, our collaborator and hospital, we spent a lot of time iterate the various design, right? And very quickly through this 3D printing approach. That's why we can go 10 design, 10 design, even up to 30 design iteratively until all the requirement are met. That means user requirement, functional requirement, as well as clinical requirement are met. So these are the major design uh, you know, thinking uh, intent. We have to uh, be uh, very clearly spelled out from the beginning. And of course, design also cover as well as the material design, right? And also the for the post-processing purpose. So there are various uh, aspects have to look into this particular uh, Look simple uh, devices, but yet uh, fundamentally has a lot of uh, biological, uh, you know, reasons, and we design this way. And other. I think later on, Dr. Uh, you know, David Allen will be able to share with you what clinicians are looking at. All right, just to give a very uh, sim simple example, uh, in terms of uh, engineering, the user requirement, uh, the patient comfort means. This swap, 3D printing swap, as compared to the conventional uh, copan or pollutant swap, should not cause any sniffing, or coughing, or even breathing during these uh, swapping procedures, right? Because there's contamination of virus, you know, and, and others. And secondly, uh, we look at this design, uh, should or prefer not to have a sharp edge as a corner, right? In particular, on the top of the swap as well as the size of the swap that serve the purpose of collecting the sample from patient uh, uh, nose pharyngeal region or MP regions, right? And also have the easy to break off of the swapping procedure, right? We can go into the uh, UTM uh, bottle, immediately seal it properly for biosafety reason, right? And finally, the uh, engineering design must fulfill, make sure these products uh, must pass fracture, uh, strengths and 
torsion strength as well as the bending strength as well, right? So we had to go through the serious mechanical testing, make sure if not better, at least compatible to the commercial gold standards. And finally, finally, the clinical validations by clinician or first line health worker, you know, health, you know, uh, like doctor or patients, they must willing to use it, feel comfortable use it, feel safe to use it, means all the user and functional requirements are met. All right, that's what uh, we are looking at from design team. And this is why we put together with a uh, very important uh, clinician input uh, from NUH, we able to slowly improve the design, uh, you know, from day one and slowly come to the final design and Dr. Ho just presented to you. All right, I think I will probably uh, stop for the time being. Later on, I will leave it biological function and to uh, uh, Dr. Allen to, uh, uh, you know, mention more de in details. So maybe before uh, Prof. Allen goes into it, I was just saying, uh, when we think of users of swaps, we usually think of only just the patient, we meaning the layman. We forget about the actual clinicians, the persons administering them. So that was the whole aspect of, like you were saying earlier, uh, consideration, considerations of um, the tensile strength or the breakage and all those aspects of it. So that was very useful, Prof. Uh, for, so that was a very useful insight. Yeah. Sorry to, to interrupt you, uh, Prof. Allen. Maybe you can carry on now. Um, actually, I had a question for you. So when you stick something up somebody's nose, right? I, I, I imagine it cannot be any more comfortable, no matter how you design it, but maybe you can prove me wrong um, without actually putting it up my nose. Maybe you can talk about that, the use aspect of it, you know, in terms of like actually on the front lines, putting it up somebody's nose. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, so the way we diagnose uh, COVID uh, is by detecting the virus, SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. And uh, traditionally, uh, not traditionally, but uh, the gold standard is a swab in the back of the throat. This is uh, uh, not uh, through the mouth. Uh, that yield is a little less, but it's actually through the nose to where you go through the opening of the nose, past the little uh, turbinates, uh, and then back to the back of the throat. And it yeah. is a relatively tight passage um, and it requires a bit of skill to do it properly without harming someone. Mm. Um, and so uh, that's where we can collect a sample. And what we're looking for is both the secretions as well as cells, uh, respiratory mm. epithelial cells. Uh, and this is where we can find the RNA, which is how we, we diagnose. So what we're looking for is clinicians. Uh, when we speak of it needs to serve clinician needs, that means it needs to be safe for our patients. That's what we're most interested in. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be able to detect uh, the virus and it needs mm -hmm. not to harm the patients in the sense that it doesn't break off in their nose, but it has to be engineered in a manner that where it breaks off into the tube that's going to process these. Mm -hmm. uh, these swabs are not re, uh, reused. They are biologic hazards uh, mm -hmm. because they contain a biological uh, hazardous material and there's no way to uh, sterilize them in a manner that makes them reusable. Mm -hmm. um, so those were some of the basic things we looked at when we were uh, talking with uh, our engineering brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. um, so we need the swab to be able to capture cells and fluid. We need it to be able to retain it as we're taking it out of the nose and then putting it into the tube that uh, transported the lab. And we need it to release the material. So capture, retain, and release. Uh, Sounds like fishing. Uh, so those are the things <laughs> Oh. Yeah, those those are the things we're looking for primarily. Um, yeah, and it, it needs to be material that has the capacity to do that, yet not harm the person in the process. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are the essential features. Okay. okay. Are there significant Asian facial physiognomy the differences between, you know, uh, um, no. um, they're no. darn. Okay. Inside, no. it's just all the same. <laughs> <laughs> I have no, no idea. Yeah. No, our, our ear, nose, and throat uh, uh, colleague, uh, Prop uh, Wang, uh, Wang De, uh, De Yun was able to tell us that once you get past the nose, uh, everybody's the same. Uh, both right. the distances, uh, <laughs> yeah, everything was everything was uh, not unusual. Oh, okay, this gets interesting. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, from the business uh, production end of it, um, I'm wondering how the, these insights feed through to the design and production end of things. You know. Um, in, in terms of like the, how Jerry and yourself came up with design inputs, how did they translate into 
um, design specs for production? I'm, I'm just wondering about the process. Maybe Dr. Ho, you can fill us in there. Yeah, so we, we as I as said, we, we actually had a, had a SWOT team and uh, so we, we actually held the, um, you know, daily task force uh, meeting. So the, the people involved are the people you are seeing right in front of you. Mm. Uh, and of course, there are additional members uh, from, from, from TUSU, from, mm -hmm. from, uh, from the other uh, community, the test, the, the lab test people as well. So the, those mm. folks are not here, but they were a very critical uh, mm. part in, of, the, of the whole team. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so basically, we we uh, we we get the design. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a kind of simpl simplified in that sense. We get the design from from NUS, and 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 this design actually is then distributed to I two I and Structo. They fabricate it, and then we will deliver samples uh, to to undergo mechanical testing as well mm -hmm. as uh, the PCR test that uh, Jerry and Bo David has mentioned. Um, and once this result is available, then we look at the results and then we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board again and see what do we need to do to tweak uh, and change and modify. Mm, okay. Uh, so this sort of went through, uh, you know, in, in many, many cycles and, and uh, mm. until we finalized, uh, we basically came to a, a design that we all felt that, yeah, it's good mm, enough. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So once so you got that going, going, they had a process that included um, maybe quality control processes, um, how you can do that at high volume, I guess, right? And also making sure that the feedstock keeps coming. So we had all these processes all in place. Um, so what kind of volumes are we talking about? Uh, well, it's in the millions. Uh, so, if, you know, the idea was that essentially based on what we were, were told, or at least we understand from uh, the, the, the intelligence reports that we're getting uh, from, the, from the hospitals and other channels, uh, so we needed to be able to come up, uh, I think the production capacity we're looking at was 120,000 per day, wow. uh, which translates to something in a ballpark of maybe three to four million per month. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, but of course, you know, this uh, whole testing capacity is not just swaps. There's the other test part of the test kit as well. You have the, I mentioned valves or tubes. Uh, which also is, is in short supply. So there was separate work streams that were dealing with that. Mm -hmm. And then also the viral transport media. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to that, there's also the, the lab testing capability. So once you swap some patients, you, you do need to, uh, you know, go through that whole PCR uh, process. So there is a cycle time to that. And I understand that that lab test capacity was the primary one that in some ways, uh, you know, is the limiter for, for our you know, national mm -hmm. test uh, okay. ability. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we have a question actually from our interchange community that was asking about um, the impressions that 3D printing is always cost prohibitive. Does it still apply? I mean, in this case, especially. I'm just wondering. I don't know whether Miles or Paul, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a stab at that. I, I think there are a couple of things in that. One, from a design aspect, which we've already spoken about, <clears throat> you know, we can iteratively change the design uh, much faster than you could do so with traditional uh, technologies. And also mm -hmm. there is a cost primarily with traditional technologies if you want to change the design. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any of that specific upfront uh, development costs that would be tr in traditional manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, design. And that is really a very key area of Parts that you would normally have in terms of saving uh, costs before you would even get into uh, mm. high scale or high volume uh, development type requirements. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it would be the fact that you can, in fact, change the design uh, moving forward. So, Dr. Ho mentioned about test tubes, and Jerry had mentioned about break off points of how we need to design the uh, length if you wish to fit the test tube so at the moment the standard would be let's say a 10 cm test tube and we have a break off point at that but if that would have fallen into a shortage then you are uh, essentially in a situation where you need to change the design to go from a 10 cm say down to a 5 cm so again and 3d printing lends that kind of flexibility that you wouldn't normally get with traditional manufacturing and then the last point I would like to make on this, and again, it's been sort of mentioned in terms of the speed at which we can actually start 
uh, producing parts vis-a-vis -vis the length of time that a traditional manufacturing would get there. So they're going to, we will be anywhere from, you know, particularly one month to two months in front of a design that has been frozen. So even if you freeze a design, it, it will take traditional manufacturing maybe, you know, four to eight weeks, depending on the tooling that they require to get moving. So mm. if you're looking for something to cover a, a shortfall in the early days, again, traditional manufacturing won't do that. So again, with the concerns people had of, um, you know, a lack of manufacturing capability in places like Italy or even China because mm. of the COVID-19, how do you actually move forward? So it's not a direct question in terms of can we be, let's say, cost effective in the millions of parts. I would say if you look at it from the early, maybe up to about three months, uh, yes, I would say to you we can be even more effective than traditional manufacturing tech technologies mm. but mm -hmm. certainly given that this is something that is let's say if it was a fixed design and you required millions of them over you know months or years then yes traditional manufacturing mm. will still have a less expensive way of manufacturing mm. okay thank you that's helpful so um i have a question sorry did i interrupt somebody no, I was uh, just well, yes. I mean, because from Strato, we have a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, okay. The short answer to this is that mm -hmm. uh, I would say the, 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 the thought that traditional manufacturing is cheaper or more cost effective than uh, 3D printing, mm -hmm. it's outdated. Mm. For us, at least uh, with our technology, um, we can be very cost competitive. Mm -hmm. And that's a short answer to it. Mm. Okay, yeah. Actually, this is spurring uh, a, a, a tangential question because when I understand um, the way traditional swabs are made, there's more than one component, right? There's like the head and then whatnot. So that calls for different suppliers, I guess. And if there are different suppliers, you if in a in a situation where there's sudden surge of demand and um, um, that there may be different uh, availabilities for different components, that would create a supply chain disruption maybe of some nature that it may be a cost component that people don't always think about they, they mainly when people think about cost it's mainly the material cost they're not really thinking as much about the, the operational cost pressures that aspect of things so that may be a complexity that people don't really think about you know they, they just think about oh the, the cost of that thing itself is it's not just that right i guess is that the right way to look at it uh, that's one way of it and i mean uh, I mean, ultimately, when it, when we talk about manufacturing, uh, whether it be a traditional or three D mm. printing, it always comes down to a few parameters, mm. right? Right. How how good your throughput is, how good your yield mm. rate is, mm -hmm. and how labor intensive your process right, is, right. right? And then of course the raw material pro uh, mm. price and all that. Mm. And uh, again, depending on the different technology and how we operate, I would say. 3D printing, at least from structural perspective, mm. can be very cost competitive. Mm, okay. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can move on to the last question I have for you. Um, this involves a bit of taking a step back because um, considering how some experts are already saying that we may look forward to, well, not look forward, but we can anticipate a future where there will be more pandemics uh, and, and, um, and, and such health, public health events of a large scale nature. Uh, which may again call for the collective efforts of the 3D printing community. I'm just wondering how the current experience with this initiative has helped to build our so-called capability maturity in this regard. In terms of like next time, there's an, another wave. Um, what lessons can we carry forward, you know, that, that will be um, kind of perennial and, and, yeah, yeah, and something that we can fall back on? Maybe Dr. Ho can take us off on this first. Yeah, I mean, of course, uh... Yeah, we we do know that this um, this sort of pandemics uh, will, you know, it's not going to be the last of it, and mm -hmm. and therefore, uh, it's very important to to understand how, uh, you know, to understand the weakness in our current uh, sort of a supply chain uh, approach and strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond the geopolitical tensions, of course, it's also in some ways um, causing risks to to traditional, uh, you know, large manufacturing countries such as China, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, so all these, if you take all this into into uh, you know um, 
into consideration. I think I think it's it's true that Singapore, no doubt, we are a small country. We do need uh, to secure and ability and capabilities to be able to to produce these uh, uh, you know I call this strategic commodities on our own if possible, if needed. Mm. Uh, we may not be able to supply it uh, for a long period of time, but we definitely must have the capability to do that. And one of the learnings that we have uh, through this whole process is that, um, um, you know, ultimately there's also, uh, there's always this economic question, right? So how, you know, after this, uh, after this uh, COVID-19, between, the, the, between this and the next uh, pandemic, you know, what's gonna happen, right? To, mm. to these uh, companies and all that. You know, my guess is that at the end of the day, uh, we need to, as, a, as an industry, right? As, as a budding industry coming up, uh, trying to, to justify its relevance in the in the manufacturing world, I think it's, it's no doubt that that we need to address some of the pain points of our uh, you know traditional manufacturer uh, mm -hmm. that is experiencing. Nobody is going to just do 3D printing just because uh, they like the technology. You have to be able to pr provide a a real uh, business value proposition, um, and I think if you use it in the right way, as we have uh, articulated and in, in some of the points by by the different partners. Um, you know, for fast prototyping, for, um, you know, jump-starting uh, quick supplies in, a, in the initial stages while you're trying to figure out how to get your traditional manufacturing line started. So those are the things, it's, it's a kind of a strategy, uh, uh, you know, the whole wholesome approach as opposed to just saying that, okay, we got to do 3D printing for the sake of 3D printing. Mm. So that's my perspective. Mm. Uh, Jen, I want to add on in terms of this, uh, uh, initiative uh, driven by uh, NAMIC from beginning mm -hmm. to the end. Uh, I think we learned the, the best lesson is collective effort from various parties. Like and we, we are able to make it from just as a research lab and move on to uh, clinical uh, you know, inputs, improvement, revision, and with industry uh, you know, partner backbone to manufacture quickly to shorten the entire cycle time or lead time. That really why it can make it happen in such short, you know, only about six weeks time, we can have this usable or, you know, um, clinical, uh, you know, products and ready for the, you know, trial, you know, so for patient try. try. So this is very uh, important lesson for us to learn, you know, every medical device or drug, it takes years and years, validation, mm -hmm. design validation, and mm -hmm. even manufacturing and finally come to the clinical trial validation that can be years time mm -hmm. yeah. and this one show is really global with our local ecosystem established with a collective party and with industry partner backbone we are, we are able to bring the idea quickly and realize it uh, as a you know usable mm. medical devices and fighting for pandemic like COVID-19 mm -hmm. okay I think this is a model we will continue to uh, follow from and we are execute it yeah mm -hmm. in future Anybody else wants to chime in? Because actually I see a question yeah. uh, coming in from the chat um, asking about how the know-how and requirements uh, from learning coming, coming out of this initiative, uh, whether they'll be shared with the rest of the 3D printing community so that they may also develop the capability to, to produce in case of a demand spike. I, I don't know whether they mean in the current situation or maybe in future. Or yeah, I, I, think, share some of yeah I can I can answer that. So mm -hmm. the yeah the the swap designs actually is a, is an open source design. Ah. So one of one of the uh, criteria that we made uh, you know and we were able to get a collective buy-in was that this should not uh, be you know just reserved for a few uh, you know suppliers or manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And also we we want actually to have more more manufacturer uh, to expand the manufacturing base. Mm -hmm. And currently, actually, we are in conversations already with a couple of manufacturers in the U.S. as well as Indonesia. Mm -hmm. and, and you know that these markets are, you know, uh, for sure that there's still a need to, you know, for them also to to make, to have their own local manufacturer and local source mm -hmm. uh, test kit supplies mm -hmm. um, on top of what, of course, what we can export as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's open source. Um, I think if there's interest to to pursue uh, anybody who's keen and has the capability. Uh, you can contact contact me uh, directly. Uh, we'll 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 take the we'll just follow up with you on that mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah. Okay. 
Jane, follow your early question in, in, in terms of what difference of the design. I think ours is local developed design and manufacturing. It's a one piece swaps as mm -hmm. compared to a gold standard. Like you say, you need the additional Ryan frog and then the, like, uh, you know, yeah. cotton and other as multiple assembly process. Mm -hmm. uh, we design from beginning to the end is one piece, one mm -hmm. print, mm -hmm. right? That's why we uh, can eliminate unnecessary additional post-processing, mm -hmm. right? But without sacrificing uh, collecting or sample the efficiency. Right, right. Yeah, that's been uh, one of the okay. design advantage. Mm -hmm. And like Chao Xing, uh, Dr. Ho mentioned, and although it's locally designed, manufactured with patenting, but these are, will be all free license to all. Mm. Okay, one final question for me before we round off this first segment. Um, it concerns this, it goes back to what Dr. Ho said earlier on about how intense this initial effort was, right? Everything was happening in, in, in high speed and under high pressure. I'm just wondering how has it stretched and or extended our capabilities in terms of like technology or, or on the technology front or in terms of clinical practice or even in terms of policy or regulatory innovation and collaboration? Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. I, I imagine there'll be, there must have been some pressure. Uh, Dave, can you rephrase that question? Ah, okay. Uh, well, I'm, th I'm thinking having gone through this intense initiative, right? Uh, where everything happened in high speed and there were, this is pretty much unprecedented in terms of the way different parties came together um, and, and making things happen so fast, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking okay. it would have stretched or extended capabilities uh, out of the norm in terms yeah. of technology, the clinical side of it, or the policy, innovation and collaboration. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think the, the well, the, the fact is, I think also there's a question from one of the one of the audience asking, what, what is the role of NAMIC, right? So, so we're actually, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, in simple ways, we're a connector of the uh, public and private uh, institutions. Uh, so we promote uh, open collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of course, with the, with the focus on on um, finding solutions and adapt, adapting solutions using 3D printing technology. And uh, why is 3D printing technology so important? Because we, we, we think uh, in terms of the future of production, um, there, is a, there is a space right, to, to, uh, that, that requires a technology, uh, you know, in this case, additive manufacturing. And one of the main, main uh, uh, I would say, advantage that this technology has, which traditional te technology doesn't have, is the ability to uh, reduce waste. So you're able to design uh, products, uh, solutions with, um, you know, directly less materials uh, because you're building it from grounds up as opposed to trying to fill a mold with, with some, uh, you know, resin or, or some, some plastic, uh, you know, liquid state. Um, mm. so, so, so that is one thing. And um, some certain industry sectors have already progressed um, to look at this in a very serious way, especially the aviation sector, where um, obviously, you know, uh, there's a whole movement of, around uh, carbon, lowering carbon emission. So the less weight of an airplane or, or payload on, a, on a, any airplane, you know, you, it will actually reduce the, the costs of the, uh, the operators as well as at the same time reduce carbon emission. So there's an entire, there's an environmental aspect to this. There's a, a sustainability uh, sub theme uh, behind why there are so much, so many proponents of, of pretty printing technology. Uh, on the, on this, on this thing about the policy and whether, um, you know, we're guided by any kind of policy, I, I don't think so. I think this was, a very good example of how um, we had a crisis, but in some ways um, uh, everybody, you know, came together. Mm. It's almost like everybody knew that we had to do something, right? So, so it was not. I don't actually have to spend a lot of time to, to convince Boyle or Miles or mm. David Allen or even Jerry to, mm. to to say let's work on this, right? It was a matter of like everybody thought the same thing, and we just figured out that what can I add value here, and let's let's work together. Mm. But I guess, I, I don't know, as a layman again, I was thinking anything to do with the health industry, healthcare side of the, there'll, there'll probably be regulations involved needing to clear certain authorities. I imagine that well, even that was fast track, right? So that must yes. have been something new for them. So that's I guess right. maybe I that's an innovation in a sense. No, absolutely. I think the, uh, as I mentioned, I think, uh, uh, the Health Science Authority, of course, they are the regulatory, uh, you know, body. They they govern. They they have a very 
clear regulatory rule. I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if there's any drugs that we take here in Singapore and, and we get sick, they get into trouble, right? If they don't do the, their job mm. well. So in that sense, I think uh, there's a, uh, always a certain level of risk when they, mm. you know, when they try to, uh, in some ways, uh, allow products to go through, uh, sort of speed track through. Um, I would say that we were very fortunate in the sense that, you know, this particular swaps uh, looks actually is a very simple device, medical device, but still, um, and I think uh, Miles and Boy can speak to that. There's still a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, technical requirements uh, in terms of quality specifications that we have to meet. Mm. And on top of that, when you bring in the clinician's perspective, they want it to be very safe. They want to be almost in some way similar in feel and, and uh, you know, to the to the to the traditional coupon swaps, mm -hmm. that that kind of uh, also in some ways uh, you know added more uh, requirements that we have to mm -hmm. you know, fulfill. Um, so uh, yeah, but the I think HSA has uh, just like uh, FDA of the United States and several uh, of the regulatory bodies around the world in health in the healthcare, mm -hmm. they, they have all stepped up and uh, you know they understand there's a crisis and uh, and you know they have speed track through mm -hmm. you know some of the some of the even some of the drugs that you know, we would have and traditionally would have taken much more longer to to uh, to clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I, I will probably ask to from from uh, Miles's and uh, Boyle's perspective um, in the follow up section uh, that's coming up right now. So for this part of the conversation, let's take a different tack by looking a little closer about the business perspective coming from Miles and Boyle, okay. Um, more specifically here, the topic is on seizing the opportunity to emerge stronger after COVID-19. Okay, so the question now to Miles and Boyle is, um, well, let me put it a little bluntly. So being part of this collective initiative clearly made business sense, okay. And from the way it looks, uh, the market is there, the demand is there, and it's seemingly unending right and there are clear pathways to scale and and basis for collaboration with this ecosystem already so that everyone has a piece of the pie so what happens when this is all over when the ep epidemic peters out you know and things more or less kind of volume well, dies yeah, down yeah. what what happens then okay maybe i maybe i take on take on this first bit um yes for, okay so in my, in my company i'm i'm typically been uh, a hardware supplier okay mm. i have a i have a company on the side which would uh, is aimed essentially at helping uh, the medical industry typically from anatomical modeling type things so it would be a very much a, a low volume um highly complex in some cases but definitely a low volume um requirement and the swab thing has really changed uh, the capability for my company to be able to offer uh, the ability to do literally, as as Charles has mentioned, millions of parts, mm -hmm. where we would not have had that currently, right? And while okay, I, I take the fact that um, you know, depending on the technologies you use, whether or not you can be as cost effective as traditional manufacturing, I guess depends somewhat on the materials that one's using uh, mm -hmm. in the three D printers. But ultimately, um, I would say to you, what this has been is is definitely an eye opener in terms of certainly the hundreds of thousands and being able to move the time frames in a much quicker way that mm -hmm. is a capability that certainly my company wouldn't have had to date in Singapore. Now, if you say what happens after swabs and if it's the same design and it's fixed for millions and millions and millions, well, we have lots of other industries. So if I give you one uh, that people are probably very familiar with, which is uh, clear aligners, right, in busy line, ah, right. like clear aligners, right, okay? Yeah. Mm -mm. And the interesting thing about that is that today, for instance, they are producing literally hundreds of thousands of these per day, right? Mm. But what's very different about this is each particular one is different. Mm. So unlike the swab design where we have a fixed design doing millions and millions of them, Mm -hmm. What we what we have, in fact, in the dental area is someone doing millions and millions, but each one being completely uh, uh, different. So essentially what we're running into what we call mass customization. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how this helps us uh, be more competitive moving forward, we would not have had 
that capability in house today to be able to address the market like that without having essentially a, a countrywide initiative to help enable mm -hmm. us with a specific project. So for me, this has been a, a, a tremendous um, opportunity in terms of how we could essentially look at our business moving forward and address different market segments. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Boyle? Yep. So uh, for Stracto, actually, we, I mean, we are, we are a machine manufacturer, right? Uh, we make 3D printer. And traditionally, before this whole COVID-19 situation, we have always been very focused on one particular industry. And I think Miles already mentioned this, which is dental industry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, dental industry is not, it's not uh, very popular and people don't really talk about it. But the reality of it is that the biggest 3D printing user in the world by far is dental industry. There's a location in Mexico and in the US basically that where they literally print hundreds and thousands of dental models mm -hmm. every day. And uh, some of them are using our machines basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are very familiar with this industry. So uh, when this whole uh, swap uh, thing came up, uh, came, uh, like came to us basically, uh, we sort of, had to shift a little bit from being a supplier to supply ourselves, basically. So we that's why we buy back some of our, uh, the machines from our customers, and we set up the manufacturing line ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, when and it's it's been good because we uh, in in the past we always uh, told ourselves, okay, you know what, we just want to supply the machines and the technology, but we don't really want to do the production ourselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, having gone through the the production and all that. Now uh, we realize that, okay, this is one aspect that we obviously can do uh, mm -hmm. going forward, right? Mm -hmm. So to your question on uh, after this whole thing is over, what next? Uh, obviously, the dental industry is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. We will still be back there. And I think that's, uh, I mean, that's where our bread and butter is. But also at the same time, uh, to complement that, we are actually right now looking at uh, probably producing things ourselves, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So thanks for pointing out. I have no idea the dental side of it is so big, but when I think about that naturally, of course, you think of the population, right? The demographics, the boomers are right now kind of in that right age group where they're starting to need all these dental um, devices. I don't know what you call them. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. And yeah it I makes think perfect what, sense, yeah. Right, right. And I think what Miles said is exactly what it is, right? It's mass customization because mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you think about it, dental job, uh, people's job is basically very unique. It's mm. almost like a fingerprint. Basically, everybody has their own unique set of jaws, mm -hmm. uh, and they and because it's unique, so if you want to make something out of it, it has to be customized. So it's mm. really mass customization, and the mm. only technology that is suitable for that kind of thing is 3D printing. Mm. Can I ask a little more specifically? Then, what kind of new cap capabilities have arisen? for you uh, in terms of this initiative? Like, apart from the sheer volume of it, I, I gather like, you no, know, the um, some, maybe some some technical aspect of it that, that require a little more precision, precision. Um, perhaps that, um, that you were not really uh, paying that much attention to, like Miles was mentioning earlier, um, your earlier, um, the, 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 the kind of things that you're producing earlier were body parts, I gather. Um, which may not necessarily require that much um, intricacy, if I may put it that way. <laughs> you, you, is that for me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I would say to you, I think there are a number of things that we've learned from this. One is actually the teamwork that Jerry mm. had mentioned earlier between the various different, um, well, requirements in terms of the regulatory bodies. And I think it's key here that we say that actually no shortcuts have been made when it's come to the regulatory requirement side of things. What has been um, accelerated, and this is really to do with the team effort and the requirements, would have been the whole clinical aspect. And essentially, um, Dr. David Allen and his team and mm -hmm. how fast that was actually uh, put through because there was a, you know, a national crisis and they stepped up and helped essentially create that. And the other thing I would, I would say, again, it comes back to the 3D printing aspect of it, but is the fact that Jerry and his team didn't actually have to make any 
um, allowances for the manufacturing technology that would be used. So I can mm -hmm. tell you that uh, Cho Seng had, uh, Dr. Ho had mentioned about injection molding streams. Mm -hmm. Well, they can't actually use the design that uh, was created for the 3D printing track, right? So this is an area where I would say to you that 3D printing is being aimed with the benefits that we can do in terms of the design and the efficacy of the design itself mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. having to make any allowances for the technology that is going to produce it. Now, I'm not trying to say that injection molded uh, design won't work. I'm just saying to you that they had to redesign it mm. in order to meet traditional manufacturing technologies. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have this new capability, if you wish, that we can design for benefit or design for purpose mm -hmm. without having to make um, compromises mm -hmm. for traditional manufacturing technologies. Mm -hmm. And then I would say to you, for me personally, what this has been in terms of a learning experience, apart from working with the different uh, entities, is obviously how we can do mass manufacturing with uh, 3D printers. Mm -hmm. And there are some... I suppose, differences in that regard. So one would be, uh, there is a concern, let's say, in the marketplace, particularly that, you know, this is not something that perhaps has been done with a specific device. I mean, it's difficult to add um, some of the regulatory requirements when if you're talking about, let's say, going back to dental, that each part is unique, right? Mm -hmm. But what we were doing essentially is producing one part in, in millions, right? right? Mm -hmm. And in that regard, to be honest, and Dr. Hurd mentioned it before, the key here was that we are leveraging the medical uh, standards in terms of ISO 13485, okay? And that brings in process with quality control mm -hmm. and checking, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm along with HSA and, and Dr. Ho's team also put out a white paper, if you wish, in terms of best practices and how we could all move forward mm. to make this happen. So there is a huge regulatory requirement aspect as part of this. Now, mm. the material itself, um, yes, this is actually coming from, in my case, uh, Form Labs, and they have already you know, this is being used in different designs worldwide. We have FDA CE approval. Then again, HSA is able to leverage mm. uh, these kind of approvals so that we don't have any regulatory issues on the material itself. Mm -mm. So that, that's really, for me, would be the major, let's say, learning points that I had from this exercise. Mm. How about you, Boyle? Any further insights on, on, on what you took away from this experience? Uh, for us, I mean, obviously, like a, a lot of the things that Miles uh, mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, we, we share the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. I think teamwork is very important. And I think the past, uh, how many weeks was that? It was it like six or seven weeks. Or it was very <laughs> intense, literally every day. I think there was no Saturday or Sunday for us. But I think we all did it because uh, mm -hmm. we know that this was for good cost, basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of learning, right? I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. for us, uh, our team, uh, mm -hmm. we we know we knew nothing about swaps, and we just like learn mm -hmm. along the way, basically. Uh, of course, I'm very fortunate because uh, I mean, I am basically right now representing a team uh, of very talented engineers uh, mm -hmm. that are working. I mean, they're behind the scene. Like, mm -hmm. if, I mean, people don't see them, but they are actually really the ones that build the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just the face of it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so all those things are, uh, uh, I mean, it's 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 been very valuable experience mm -hmm. for us. But one thing for sure for us, and for me anyway, um, if I want to take one thing about uh, uh, like one very big point of learning here, is about manufacturing about scaling up manufacturing. I think mm -hmm. uh, it's it's one thing about making a prototype to be successful. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to be making a few prototypes to be successful. And it's completely different thing to be making millions of uh, like high quality product, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a learning curve there. And mm -hmm. obviously because this, weren't, this thing was not our industry per se. So it took a while for us at the beginning to, okay, yes, 
fine tuning here, fine tuning there, fine tuning here, fine tuning there again. <laughs> uh, but we're getting there. So that's that's one of the very big learning that we have. And, mm -hmm. and people tend to not appreciate manufacturing, right? Because okay, uh, it's not as sexy as, for example, the the R and D part of it, right? Like mm -hmm. oh, we are making a new design, we're doing this cool prototype thing, but really being able to day in day out replicate the same thing with high quality mm -hmm. and making sure that the things that we turn out to customers, mm -hmm. and in this case to clinicians basically, are of the same standard every time. That's that's a, that's a challenge, and yeah. that's something that we learned. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then sometimes the, sim the the seemingly simplest things of like, oh, just do it over and over and over again. That is kind of underrated, right? People yes, don't, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 okay. yes. Manufacturing is a skill. Mm, okay. Yeah. So I, I guess from hearing from you both, I, I, I was a little bit like, you know, surprised, well, slightly, slightly surprised that it seems like the soft aspects, the human factors and collaborative aspects were where you guys focused on in terms of where you saw the main experiential learnings, uh, uh, you know, in, in, as far, in as far as your, your, your experience of this initiative goes. It's not so much technological innovation, the intricacies of, of coming up with, with the technology itself. It's more the human side of it, you know. So that's, that's quite interesting. I never saw that coming. So thank you. That was uh, insightful. <laughs> I mean, it's, a hum it's always the human behind, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> for I mean, better or for worse. To, people, people tend to forget about these things, right? But yeah, really, yeah. it's, it's uh, the, the engineers, the technicians, mm -hmm. the people, the operators who mm -hmm. operate machines, all these people who, I mean, they will never be named. Mm -hmm. People don't right. know yeah. about them, but they, these are the people who actually yeah. make these things happen. Yeah. And the fact that I noticed you both are actually in the dental space, you kind of are competitors in a sense, right? The fact that uh, you're not at loggerheads now, that's like, wow, kudos to you. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if Miles no? is actually strictly speaking on... No? No, no not at all? Maybe you wanna... Are you in dental space? <laughs> well, we, we supply equipment into the dental space. Ah, okay. Yeah. We're coming at this slightly from different... Mm. So they're, they're a, an actual machine manufacturer. Okay. seller of machines. Okay. The end, it is similar for both. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we have a different set of machines that right. we would serve the dental market mm. for, right? Okay. Mm. And typically, you know, we have bunches of customers in Singapore, Malaysia, mm. Indonesia, which is mm. our main footprint, mm -hmm. and Form Labs would have worldwide or even mm. a company. Company, right, 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 yeah. Mm. So in terms of, let's say, the technical aspects of it, mm. yeah, we're very familiar with the uh, equipment, right? and what benefits essentially to each different technology that this equipment can bring, right? Mm -hmm. The dental one is interesting just purely because there is more of a digital revolution occurring within that industry. And, and obviously if it's digital, then you're talking about 3D printing. So, mm -hmm. and because of the fact that let's say traditional manufacturing has been in this case, very manual. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though you have an injection molding machine at, mm. in the current situation producing millions of parts. No, it's very much a manual style process. Mm -hmm. So both what Struxdose provides in terms of the hardware and what we provide as a third party. Okay, hey. Similar <laughs> hardware, if you wish. Okay, um, okay. We both have dental. Right. Um, but I think one of the key aspects, honestly, in, in what we now both bring to the party is the fact that if you look at general manufacturing, mm -hmm. is this capability which is still really yet to take off, um, is the whole aspect of design. Okay? Mm -hmm. so if you design for purpose, um, the reason is, is that so much of design today is still very much driven around what we can produce in traditional manufacturing technology, such mm -hmm. as injection molding. Right? Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is there is a move, right? There is definitely a shift towards, um, let's say more manufacturing, and I use the term mass customization, but even if you said, you know, you talk to a traditional injection molding person, they don't really want to have to do things less than, you know, Mm. And pieces or whatever, so mm. it would be difficult for them to address certain markets. Mm. You wouldn't see them in things like them. 
Right. Uh, but there are, you know, many, um, let's say, case studies, I mean, some which I'm happy to share if people want, but in terms of how design, you know, completely changes the way that a particular part is manufactured. Mm. When you use just design tools to do that without any mm. input for compromise in terms of traditional manufacturing, it's amazing the type of shapes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are created. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can only then be designed or yeah. rather yeah. manufacturable, or manufacturable but, even, right? Right, and we don't have the same constraints. And I right. think, you know, what has been an eye opener, is, as Boyle has basically said for them and uh, and us in terms of the manufacturing space, is mm -hmm. the ability that we now have mm -hmm. to address. Whereas, you know, we we were focused, as I said, on primarily selling equipment, mm. all focused on manufacturing equipment mm -hmm. and producing new equipment. And now we both have capabilities to actually right. yeah. mass manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Now what we wind up doing with that, we may go in slightly different directions with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my main reason for m mentioning dental was, as Boyle said, it is what people don't realize it is, you know, Probably, I say probably, and it maybe is, uh, the largest mm -hmm. user of 3D printers in the world in mm -hmm, terms of mm -hmm. the number of parts produced, I would say absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, and there are a number of different companies out there uh, doing it in high volume, and mm -hmm. they're using different 3D printing technology. So it doesn't mean that everybody uses one particular technology. SLA would have mm -hmm. been. The one that, let's say, I mentioned to you with the in, invisible braces aligned mm. to, or Invisilign, as people know, mm -hmm. and that definitely have been initially an SLA mm -hmm. technology, but that is mm -hmm. not the only technology that's being used today. Right. As well, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. His technology is slightly different, and he has a, a market share within the dental, the dental industry. So mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, yes, to be an end user of our products rather than just always selling the product. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So, thank, thank you so much, so much for your roles in it, driving it, it, the message it, it, of this, 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 if I may put it this way, a paradigm shift, right, in terms of manufacturing, right? It's, it's not just a concept anymore. It's not just theoretical. You're actually making it happen and showing that it's viable, right? So, um, I think we have some other questions, but I'm, I'm afraid we're coming out of time. So, perhaps um, we can take these questions uh, off onto interchange after this session, where mm -hmm. um, we we'll actually encourage most of our audiences to actually join us on the interchange platform, where we get to, a chance to actually continue interactions and conversations with our speakers, and also get the chance to tackle the questions that some of you have asked. And with that, thank you so much for joining us today.